for this meeting has begun. So what I what I want to do is I want to give some background on what's been going in agriculture. What I what I think is the underlying cause why we have so many vitamin and mineral deficiencies in developing countries. So this is the slide that uh, I've been showing for a long time. This is uh, changes between 1965 and 1999. This dotted line is 100%. This blue line, is, blue bar is developing country population, right at 100%. So population doubled during that period. Back uh, when our system, the CGIR, was first getting started, people were worried about famines because of that population. They knew that population growth was coming. So we had the Green Revolution. We had high yielding varieties of, of rice and wheat and maize. And the, you know, the great part of the story was we were these, the production, especially in South Asia, was able to outstrip population growth. So what I want to, what I want to talk a lot about is rather dietary quality. And these bars represent pulse production. I'm not going to talk specifically about pulses, but it's a holder for vegetables, fruits, uh, pulses, animal products. Production increased, of pulses and in, production increased by a quarter, but it didn't keep pace with population growth. Neither did vegetable production, neither did fruit production, neither did animal and fish production. So what happens to prices when you have that sort of a situation? These are prices for Bangladesh. I like to divide the diet into food staples, non-staple plant foods, fish and animal products. Non-staple plant foods can be uh, dense in minerals and vitamins. Fish and animal products are also dense and the, they're highly bioavailable. They're the best sources of minerals and vitamins in the diet. <clears throat> so I've indexed prices at the beginning when the modern varieties were first being introduced. And we all know that rice prices fell by 40% by the end of the 1990s. So it's a great thing for poor people because Rice is their basic staple. For example, in Bangladesh, it's cheaper. But I want to draw your attention to the, to the green and the red bars. You can see that prices doubled during that period because you didn't have the same productivity increases. So the problem for poor people is that dietary quality became more expensive. If your income didn't also grow, it was more difficult for you to afford vegetables and fruits and animal products. That's the main theme of what I want to talk about. So this is, these are some surveys that we did at IFPRI in the mid-1990s in Bangladesh. This is in the rural areas. So 80% of energy came from rice, and only 3% of energy came from fish and meat products. But if you use the same pie chart and you look at their food expenditure, you can see that already a quarter of their budget, their food budget, which is maybe 20% of their income, went for fish and animal products. So that's what, that's what people want to buy. That's what people want to spend their money on because that's what they enjoy and that's what they need for good health and nutrition. But prices have been going up. And so even though they spend a fair amount of their budget here, it only represented a very small part of their diet. And so therefore, their mineral and vitamin intakes are too low. So these are, those were some price information from Bangladesh. These are some data from India. So again, you have the same situation where rice prices came way down. And then we had the, we had the price spikes in 2008, 2009. We all heard about rising food prices. It wasn't rising food prices. It was rising food staple food prices. Everybody talks about food security. And they mostly, it's what they're really thinking about is staple food security, energy security. So, so now rice prices, instead of being 40% lower, they're now around 20% lower, wheat prices. And in recent years, in the recent one or two or three last years, they've, they've actually come down and, and people aren't so worried about the high food prices anymore. But this is, again, this is the, the data for India, what's been happening with the, with the non-staple foods. And you can see we have the price series all, right, all the way out to 2010 here. 
And you can see that there's just been a general rise in the prices of those foods. So again, it's just getting more and more expensive over time because demand for those foods are high, the, the productivity increases just haven't been there. So we did, a, we did a simulation analysis. We wanted to see what might happen to iron intakes due to food price increases. So this was the food expenditures that I showed you for Bangladesh earlier in the 1990s. So you've got about uh, maybe a third of your expenditures on non-food. You've got the food staples, non-staple plant foods, fish and animal products. That's the proportion of your food expenditures. And we simulated a 50% increase in all food prices, like what happened in the 2008-2009 price spike. So what do the poor do? When the rice price goes up, they have to keep eating the same amount of rice to keep from going hungry. That's their first priority. So they have to spend more on rice. So therefore, you have to spend less on these other things. So therefore, you spend less on dietary quality, and not only do you spend less, the prices are higher. So what this simulation showed for Bangladesh, there's already a lot of iron deficiency here in this previous situation. Iron intakes go down by 30% in the, in the after situation. So when I, when I hear about food price rises and food staple price rises, what I think about is that dietary quality is getting worse and worse. It isn't so much that people aren't buying the same, about the same amount of rice. The problem is, is that their dietary quality is getting worse and worse and worse. So the price of vitamin A is going up over time. The price of iron is going up over time. The price of zinc is going up over time and, and many other minerals and vitamins as well. So that's the, that's the, that's the background, okay? So when we've, we've been at this for many years, some of us trying to convince people in agriculture that they have an important role to play in solving the malnutrition problem. Back in the 1990s, when people discovered mineral and vitamin deficiencies, the nutrition community want, wanted to implement, and they are implementing, supplementation, fortification, other types of programs. They saw the gap. And they said, that's our role. And agriculture said, yeah, that is your role, not our role. Now it's a, it's a different situation today. There's a lot of people that recognize that agriculture has a role to play. We're not going to completely close the gap with agriculture. We still need fortification, supplementation, other types of nutrition interventions. But agriculture has to work with the nutrition community to solve the problem. And so that's the, to me, that's the background that motivates biofortification. This is, uh, so, so those of you, you get in audiences where people in agriculture just aren't convinced that they really have an important role to play in nutrition. This is a, this is a picture taken from Bangladesh in the 1990s. Uh, some researchers from Cornell University confirmed that this is rickets due to calcium deficiency. So there's an area in the southwestern part of, southeastern part of Bangladesh, where this rickets started appearing over a fairly wide area. And no, no one, it affected no one over the age of 20. It was younger people that it was affecting. So what happened was, with the introduction of the modern varieties, the change in the food system, something happened to the calcium supply in that area. And no one was, in some sense, no one was paying attention. And so this is, you know, this is what happens when uh, you don't pay attention to how your agricultural policies are affecting, you know, your dietary quality, your mineral and your vitamin intakes. It's a, it's a very visceral uh, image. So, we, we know we have all the pieces that we, we have several pieces of the puzzle to solve the problem. We all want dietary diversity. That's the ultimate solution to the problem. It's going to take decades before the incomes of the poor rise enough 
to where they can eat the kinds of diets that we're all used to. Um, so there are these other things that need to take up the slack in the meantime. And as I've said, there are lots of agriculture has an important role to play. And biofortification is just one piece of the puzzle. It's not, it's obviously not a silver bullet. It's just one piece and I'll argue a cost effective and sustainable piece of the puzzle. So first, uh, a little bit before I get into the cost effectiveness, what is biofortification? It's very simply uh, this, this orange maize, for example, that's high in pro-vitamin A. Africans eat white <clears throat> maize. They prefer white maize. The whiter, the better in general. White maize has no vitamin A in it. Africans, vitamin A deficiency is a huge problem in Africa. If we can get African farmers and consumers to substitute one or one, growing the orange maize for the white maize. They're just as high yielding, they're just as productive, so they will sell for the same price. So the value proposition to the mothers is, which will you buy for the same price? Will you buy the one that has vitamin A or will you continue buying the white maize? Will you buy the orange maize and protect your family from vitamin A deficiency, or will you continue growing and eating the white maize? It's just, it's just as simple as that. Now, Harvest Plus, uh, all the crops that I'll talk about, the third part of my presentation is on the progress that we're making. All the crops breeding and releases that I'll talk about are using conventional crop breeding. So to develop these orange mazes, we started with some varieties that we found in Thailand that were orange. We did some high level genetics. We found through marker assisted selection certain genes that were important in raising the vitamin A content of the maize. But it's all, it's all conventional plant breeding. Some of it very, very high end plant breeding. You can use transgenic approaches. You've probably all heard about the golden rice. And that's, that's also an important technique, but for, for reasons of not wanting to deal with the politics of GMOs, Harvest Plus has decided to just use conventional breeding. Not because we think transgenics are dangerous, just simply the politics are very difficult. So I'm, uh, as Mira mentioned, I'm trained as an economist, and I've always been uh, attracted by the cost, the potential cost effectiveness of biofortification. The basic idea is you can do the breeding. Agriculture research is very powerful, very cost effective. You can do the breeding in a central location. You have the basic varieties that are high yielding and high in nutrients. You can make that germplasm available to national agriculture research institutes all around the world, they get adapted to the, to the growing system, they get in the food system, and you don't, you don't have recurring costs year after year after year. So the, the most of the costs are up front in doing the research to develop the varieties, but once they're out in the system, it's very sustainable, and very, the recurring costs are very low, and that's, that's at the heart of the cost effectiveness of biofortification. And I'll go into you know I'll go into more detail before we we start getting into some of the numbers. Um, the Copenhagen consensus uh, was a, is a group of economists that that every few years uh, rank different types of investments that can be made uh, in developing countries. Uh, what are the most cost effective in 2008? They were, they were asked to pick the 20 most cost effective investments and three out of the top five were uh, related to reducing mineral and vitamin deficiencies. And at the time, uh, our ex ante benefit cost analyses were convincing enough that even though we hadn't really implemented biofortification at that point, they, they ranked biofortification as the, as, one, as, the, as the fifth most productive investment that could be made. So there's a, there's a huge drag on economic development because of the minerals and vitamin deficiencies. So there's huge benefits to be had and there are different ways of, of addressing the problem. So um, 
I won't, I won't go through that, those original ex-ante benefit cost analyses, but recently our team at Harvest Plus, including Keith, who's going to answer all the difficult technical questions that come up, they, they did a portfolio analysis. They looked at different types of interventions uh, that, that could be made, and they looked at uh, trade-offs and complementarities between biofortification and fortification. They looked at Intervent vitamin A interventions in Zambia. We have the pro vitamin A maize that we're introducing in Zambia. They looked at zinc interventions in Bangladesh. We have a high zinc rice that we're introducing into Bangladesh. And they looked into iron interventions in the state of Rajasthan. And we have a high iron formulate that we're introducing in Rajasthan. It's a, it's a very detailed analysis. They're using an ex ante uh, simulation model, but the important thing is they have food expenditure surveys, um, ideas of what the food intakes are for urban populations, rural populations, farms, non-farms, uh, different socioeconomic groups. And they, they've looked at all those groups, uh, you know, farmers versus non-farmers, et cetera, et cetera, because we're looking for the niches of the different uh, types of interventions. So obviously biofortification's niche is with the farming community. We start with the, with the smallholder farmers who grow the biofortified crops, they eat them, and then they move into the, into the marketing system and then later on into the urban areas. Whereas the fortification really, their strength starts in the urban areas and then they reach into the rural areas. So this is a this is a highly disaggregated uh, model that they're using, and they're they're seeing how different groups are affected, and they've done the analysis in Zambia, Bangladesh, and Rajasthan. Another important thing is that they've used a 30-year time horizon, and as I'll explain with some of the following slides, biofortification in the first few years, biofortification is not cost-effective. You spend a lot of money up front. When you first introduce the varieties, you're reaching a small number of people, and the cost effectiveness is only after a long period of time when you've been able to scale up and they're widely adopted and widely eaten. And that's where the, the long-term benefits come in. So we'll start with Zambia. Um, there there uh, is currently implemented a sugar fortification um, and there are, there are various different types of fortification uh, mm -hmm. vehicles that are, that are being proposed. There's child health weeks, which uh, include vitamin A supplements. And the first thing they did was they, they looked at each intervention as a standalone intervention without looking at the, the trade-offs and complementarities. And they so the the cutoff for whether an intervention is cost effective is usually the cost is something like two hundred dollars per dally saved disability adjusted life year saved if you can if you can spend less than two hundred dollars per disability life dally um, it's cost effective so they found that all of these all of these interventions are cost effective because they're below the two hundred dollar cutoff. The most cost effective was putting uh, retinol in uh, vegetable oil, but the biofortified vitamin A maize, VAM, vitamin A maize, uh, the estimated uh, cost per daily save was $24. So it's, it's highly cost effective. So now to look at, um, to look at the, the different combinations. Now this is way too, complicated to understand this slide, but what they did was they took all different combinations. So you can take each individual, you can take two interventions together, you can take three interventions together, six interventions together, etc. You have a whole array of combinations that you can try. And these represent some of, you know, all the different combinations, not all of them, but many of the different combinations. And you can see that even the most expensive, it comes out, the average is $71 per dolly saved. So all of these, all of these are cost effective. So the base message is there's plenty of room, even if you implement several different types of vitamin A interventions, they all have their own niches. There's plenty of room 
uh, to try to address the problem. Okay. Now it turns out that the most effective combination of two and the most effective combination of three and the most effective combination of four and the most effective combination of five all included biofortification because it had a niche in the rural areas with the farmers that the other interventions did not have or that biofortification had the most strongly. So I don't know how well you can see this, but this is comparing the reach of sugar fortification with the reach of uh, the vitamin A, the biofortified maize. So what this shows here for the rural areas is that the sugar reached 48 plus 9, 57% of the population. The maize reached this percent of the population, I think it's 81% of the population in the rural areas. And this orange part, 35%, are the people that the maize biofortification reached that the sugar fortification did not reach. This 9% of the people that the sugar fortification reached that the biofortified maize did not reach. Between the two, 8% of the population was not reached by either one. Okay. So you can see that there's a, there's a huge chunk of the population that the biofortified maize reached. So for example, the sugar didn't, nor the oil. You, you can make different slides comparing the two different things. And of course, when you, that's for the rural areas. When you go to the urban areas, of course, this chunk for biofortified maize is going to be smaller. Okay, but it's still, it was still surprisingly high, 21%, because maize is overwhelmingly the food staple that the Zambians eat. Yeah, I've got to watch my time a little bit. So when you, when you go over the 30-year horizon, you can see that the, um, the Dali saved are more in the rural areas than they are in the urban areas. But still, there's a substantial number of Dali's that can be saved by the biofortified maize in the urban areas. And, we're, and I think the simulations assume that the biofortified maize was only accounting for 30% of the total production and consumption of maize in the country. So even though our reach was only 30%, it was still a highly cost-effective uh, intervention. We'll move, on to, we'll move on to zinc in high zinc rice in Bangladesh. We estimated that uh, it cost $79 for Dali Save, and it was much more cost effective than the um, putting zinc in the fortifying zinc in the wheat flour. Okay, so in, in Zambia, the vegetable oil was the most cost effective, but biofortification was also cost, not quite as good, but still cost effective. Here we found that the high zinc rice was the most cost effective. Uh, intervention compared to the fortification. So it's going to vary by country depending on the nutrient and the country situation. <clears throat> so at baseline, 73% presently, or at baseline in the simulation, 73% of the population are zinc deficient in Bangladesh. They looked at how increases in income would improve the diet over a 30 year period. Yeah, income does improve diets, but it didn't eliminate zinc deficiency, didn't come anywhere close. But if you introduce the high zinc rice and it becomes widely adopted, you can reduce zinc deficiency to 26%. And adding the wheat flour fortification didn't really, doesn't really affect uh, the, the zinc prevalency. It's better probably to put iron in the, in the wheat flour. We're not we're not affecting iron through the high zinc rice. And then it's, it's very, uh, one of the things I, it's very important to note is, as I've mentioned already, the cost effectiveness depends on the level of adoption. If only 5% of people adopt the high zinc rice, it's not cost effective. But if 80% adopt the high zinc rice, it's 
it's highly cost effective. Okay, so that's that's something to keep in mind, and that's kind of the drama with biofortification. Now we've done the breeding, we've done the nutrition studies, can we get high levels of adoption? And if we can, we're home free. The other thing I want to I want to point out is uh, something I mentioned in the beginning is the lower current cost. So in these simulations for Bangladesh, this is the cost of wheat flour fortification. So with fortification, with supplementation, you have the same recurrent cost year after year after year. The population is growing. You're having to fortify a larger and larger supply. So over time, the costs go up. But with biofortification, you have these initial costs. With the, with the agriculture research, but over time, your costs get lower and almost basically almost disappear. In this particular simulation, we put all of the high, we put all of the harvest plus costs for developing high zinc rice, we loaded them into the Bangladesh simulation. So when we go to the calculations for India, we don't have any costs, right? Because <laughs> we've already loaded them in the Bangladesh simulation. So I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over the uh, rest of the slides on cost effectiveness because I'm supposed to finish in the next five minutes, and I want to talk a little bit about the progress that we've made now under Harvest Plus. So we have certain we we pick certain target countries where we had our first releases. So the vitamin A sweet potato, which SIP worked on, our potato center worked on before. Uh, Harvest Plus got started, but was part of Harvest Plus for in the beginning. They already had varieties available in 2007. But our first uh, varieties that we developed under Harvest Plus completely under, from the beginning when Harvest Plus started in 2003, we released our first vitamin A cassava in Nigeria at the end of 2011. So you can see that's an eight, eight or nine year process to do the breeding, get get through the varietal release committee. We've also released varieties in DR Congo now. Our high iron beans were released in 2012 in Rwanda and then later in DR Congo. Our pro vitamin A maize was released in Zambia in 2012. So we had, you know, we've had three years of experience now. High iron perlmillet was released in uh, India 2012. High zinc rice was released in Bangladesh 2013. Uh, they now have a release uh, in India through the Indian uh, University in one of the states. I think uh, wheat uh, was sold as truthfully labeled seed last year in India and uh, will be released in Pakistan this year. I was just in Pakistan and uh, you know, the, the variety has been released and will be planted for the first time in November now in Pakistan. So this is what's been happening in our target countries. Harvest Plus mm -hmm. is committed now to raising the funding and doing what it takes to try to scale up the delivery of crops in these mm -hmm. target countries. But we've been sharing the germplasm with National Agriculture Research Institutes around the world. Biofortified crops are now released in 27 countries. I think actually Pakistan is now the 28th country. And uh, we're in, we're in multi-location testing in an extra like 18 countries now. The, the pipelines are still, uh, we have our initial releases in countries, but the pipelines are still, we have better varieties coming out in the future, even in our target countries with higher nutrient levels and hopefully higher yields as well. We've also we've also invested in these other crops, but not as much as in the in the main crops in our in the, in the previous slide. I was uh, we I've been going to China every year for the last 11 years, and we finally got the Chinese government to agree to invest in its own biofortification program that'll be part of their next five-year plan. Brazil has its own biofortification program. <laughs> They've had one now for six or seven years. They're working on 11 different types of biofortified crops. Yeah, I've reached my limit, but I have a few other things to go. So that, actually those are remarks that I should have made on this slide. So the green shows all the different countries where there have been releases or where the crops are in, in multi-location testing. So it gives you a, 
gives you a sense of the uh, global reach now of the biofortified crop. We have to do nutrition studies. We have to. We had to prove to the nutrition community that the biofortified crops could improve uh, iron deficiency, vitamin A deficiency. We've done the studies on the on the iron crops. There's even been a, been a meta analysis of the different studies uh, that was presented at Micronutrient Forum last year in Ada. Uh The high pro vitamin A crops. Uh, we still have two efficacy trials in the field, but we have we have a lot of very positive evidence already on maize, on cassava, on sweet potato. So we're pretty much home on the vitamin A crops. We're not home yet on the high zinc crops. Uh, they were the last to be developed. Uh, we have um, we have bioavailability studies that show um, that the bioavailability is what we hoped for, what we expected. We have three efficacy trials uh, ongoing in India. One of them has been completed. They're doing the data analysis, and we'll do a fourth trial in Bangladesh for the high zinc rice that will start next year. And so by the end of next year, we should have all the evidence in on the high zinc crops. Um, we had, a, we had an especially, just to give you a flavor of uh, some of the results, pearl millet um, is high in iron anyway, and we have a, a higher iron pearl millet. And uh, we took a group of children who were age 12 to 6 and uh, fed them the high iron pearl millet. And within six months, we resolved all the iron deficiency in the subjects in the, in the intervention group. So that's, that's been published and um, is there in the literature. A little bit on the dissemination of orange sweet potato. Uh, we did a pilot study in Uganda and Mozambique. Uh, we introduced, uh, we had intervention villages, we had control villages, we did baseline studies, we did follow-up studies. After two years, we did the follow-up studies after two years. Uh, in the intervention villages, they switched to the orange sweet potato. They doubled their vitamin A intakes compared to the control villages. We measured an improvement in serum retinol in the intervention villages, um, and that's all. That's all been published. It's mentioned in the Lancet uh, article on the special edition on nutrition. But that's not all. <laughs> it's like it's like so. A researcher from IFPRI went back to the Mozambique area two years. So we did that. We did that intervention for two years. We did the follow-up survey. He went back after two more years, so four years after the baseline study, two years after we quit doing anything in the area, and he measured the level of diarrhea in the intervention villages among preschool children compared with the, the intervention compared with the control, and he found that the, the incidence of diarrhea was 50% lower in the intervention villages, and the, the duration of the, of the diarrhea was shorter in the intervention villages. So that just gives some feeling for the, um, the sustainability, the why, why it's so cost effective, because we didn't do anything in the area for two years, but it was still there in the food system. People were getting more vitamin A, and the immune systems were benefited from, from the higher vitamin A intake. I'm going to skip a bunch of slides. I'm going to make this the last slide. Okay, so what's the what's Harvest Plus now is involved in trying to scale up all over the world, and we know Harvest Plus staff is small, and so we know that our job is to mainstream, uh, get other institutions to mainstream the use of biofortified <coughs> crops in their activities. So one of our one of our main thing is to get seed companies, private seed companies, to develop and market their own biofortified varieties. We have hybrid varieties of pearl millet in India. We're finding it's the small and medium-sized companies that want to take this on first. They want to increase their market share. The big companies are already comfortable. They don't like to try new things until they tell that it's caught on. So we, we have the same thing in Zambia with the uh, three private seed companies. They're hybrid varieties of maize. 5% of commercial seed production in Zambia this year is going to be the orange maize seed. 
and the government has already included the orange maize in their in their sub they they sell subsidized seed to farmers so they've included now the orange maize seed in their subsidy program so it's it's an even playing field between the white and the orange maize we need international financial institutions to support the scale up the world bank is now riding the scale up of biofortified crops and their grants and their loans to countries in africa uh, we know about uh, one, the grant for Uganda has been signed. Uh, they're working on a grant for Mozambique. There are a couple of things going with, uh, with DR Congo. EFAD is, is doing the same thing with their loans. Uh, we need to get multilateral agencies involved. We've got the Purchase for Progress uh, World Food Program uh, buying now the high iron bean in Rwanda. They're buying locally, storing in their warehouses. By buying the biofortified beans and storing those in their warehouses, they add a nutrition dimension to an already you know, well-functioning program. So that's what I tell all the agencies. If you just take, uh, you know, you're working on a food staple and whatever program it is, you substitute a biofortified crop, you've added a nutrition dimension to whatever your program is. We have a process now going in Codex. Uh, they've, they've voted now on new work for biofortification. They're developing a definition uh, and standards now for biofortified crops. And that's gonna facilitate the international trade in biofortified crops. I've mentioned already these governments are now investing and they have their own independent biofortification programs. We want their scientific, their large scientific establishments scientists to contribute to the scientific knowledge and the spread of biofortified crops. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in Africa, the African Union has endorsed uh, biofortified crops. I was a little bit uh, the, the uh, commissioner for agriculture and the rural economy spoke at the fortification summit at the end of the fortification summit in Tanzania. And she had, of course, in, endorsed fortification, but she said, I think we need more biofortification than we need fortification because we like we like our foods fresh and to have these minerals and vitamins in our you know in our fresh foods. So it's a little bit embarrassing, but I was of course glad to hear it. <laughs> and uh, finally I want to mention that uh, we want uh, we want international NGOs to be involved in mainstreaming. So we have we've had a partnership now with World Vision for three years. Uh, they work, World Vision works in 90 countries that they're, they're, uh, want to work biofortified crops into their agricultural programs as a way of linking agriculture and their health programs. And we've just secured our first, um, our first uh, grant from the Canadian government to work with World Vision in four different countries to, uh, to introduce biofortified crops there. So I've gone over time. So. <laughs> Anyway, thank you. I'm happy to uh, happy to answer questions. Thank you, Hardy. That was fascinating. I think the, the journey that uh, Hardy took us from careful breeding of crops to um, documenting the evidence of impact on nutrition outcome to looking at cost effectiveness and then laying out the potential for scale up is is uh, extremely um, well, carefully done, but also holds lots of promise. I know there are lots of people with questions uh, in the room. Before we move on to the questions, Aaron, do you want to say how? Yeah, uh, please. Um, so we've got the audio figured out. It's working well. <laughs> but if we're going to ask a question from the room, essentially, if you are anywhere from Stephen and forward at the table, please go ahead and just ask your question. It'll pick up fine. Anyone farther away, go ahead and ask your question. <laughs> but then I'm going to ask either, as you prefer to do it, either one of the co-chairs or the presenter to repeat it since you're close to the, the pickup and then go from there. Does that sound workable? Fantastic. And there's been really good discussion online so far around uh, nutrient soil content, how that interacts with biofortification, um, around comparisons to arm sweet flesh sweet potato, or around behavior change interventions that need to go along with the introduction of these types of crops, et cetera. So I think there'll be some discussion with that. Um, but probably best to begin with a couple questions in the room yes. and then I'll work with Rosamund to get some questions. Excellent. Okay, so I, let's see. Yes, I see at least two hands over here. Before we get the hands started, I just want to note to self.
next time instead of cookies, we have bar for Sweet potatoes. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever been asked for Cookies are awesome. <laughs> okay, we want to stop there since you like the cookies and then we'll move on to yeah. it. And let's see the other questions. So I was actually in a training last week and we had to um, measure the cost of a diet and then consider options to fill in nutrient gaps. And of course, biofortification came up. But a lot of the nutritionists in the room were more on the humanitarian side, and they expressed concerns about hybrid versus open pollinating varieties. And I really felt inadequate about answering it. So I'm wondering um, how you would answer a question like that, um, considering the very vulnerable populations in rural areas and their ability to buy seed directly there. Right. So let's take a few questions okay. and then we'll wrap them up. <coughs> Yay. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, I work in the gender group in the World Bank, no, and I have a couple of questions. One of which is about changing tastes and how you, what other kind of interventions have to go along with switching people's demand from white maize to other sorts of maize. Um, having spent a lot of time in Zambia, I know how people prize white maize, and having whole grain is a sort of the choice of the poor. And the second one is particularly about the role of women in the family and how you reach, how, what interventions you do particularly to, to reach like right. women, both as determining their children's <clears throat> diet and also as producers of crops. Okay, we'll take things. one more question there and then we'll go to... Uh, Spicy, you will do with, with, with uh, Rosio. She's going to haunt you on that. That part of the puzzle, and you make a very convincing case on that part of the puzzle and the cost effectiveness of it. Could you discuss that with regard to the other parts of the puzzle? Uh, and you know, you might have I like the tomato. On how that compare, that cost effectiveness compared to other interventions in the earth system, livestock being aged. In Washington State, we're starting to look at high lysine pulses. I'm a especially. Well, we can Thank you. So, how do maybe you want to take these three questions and then we'll go online, take a couple of questions from there and come back to the room? Okay. I'll, I'll go in reverse. Um, so, on the, if, I were, if I were Minister of Agriculture <laughs> of a country, that would be the first thing, one of the first things I would attack as a long run uh, strategy. You have to you have to increase the productivity of the non-staple foods. So uh, agriculture research, whatever infrastructure you needed to uh, uh, put in, you know, but subject to budget constraints, um, that's, to me, that's one of the most fundamental things uh, that needs to be done. Of course, there's a big incentive from the private sector since the prices are going up and up and up, but, um, you know, to me, that's, that's fundamental. But it's not going to, what, I, what I've discovered about poor farmers is that when they grow something that's high value, they sell it because they, they just feel they can't, it's too, much, it's too much luxury to eat that high value food. So that's, a, that's very much long term. Then biofortification is something that used to, well, 10 years ago it was long term, but now we have the varieties. Country after country that I go to, they, they ask, why are you only bringing this one crop? We want all your crops. And now we can. We can bring in all the seeds from, you know, for multi-location testing. All that, all that uh, investment has been done now. And uh, we just, uh, Pakistan wanted uh, the orange maize. They said, that's our fastest growing crop. I said, well, you don't, uh, you don't eat that much maize in Pakistan, but they, you know, they still thought it might be a useful thing to test, et cetera. Um, so that's on the, so, you know, to me, there are high, biofortification is now relatively short run, but increasing the productivity of the non-staple foods is an important element uh, that needs to be taken care of. On the, on the taste of the orange maize and the role of the women, um, First of all, on the role of the women, it's absolutely the women that we're targeting with our messages, because they're mm -hmm. the ones more than the men that are that are concerned about the nutrition of, of their families, mm -hmm. and the, the women both as farmers and as uh, you know the person who's preparing the food and is uh, responsible for the recipes. Mm -hmm. Now, with um, with the tape, there are two different cases. You've got you've got iron and zinc 
which you can't see and which you can't taste, and you've got vitamin A, which changes the color. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get a chance to talk about Rwanda, but we've, we've introduced high iron beans. We've introduced 10 varieties. We're doing national surveys to confirm that the yields of the biofortified varieties are higher than the normal beans. But I'm told that the average yield of the, uh, the biofortified beans is a ton and a half, and the average yield is a ton of the, north, the regular beans. That's going to that's gonna drive the spread and the adoption of the high iron beans. We've already been able to make the high iron beans available to 30% of bean farmers in Rwanda. And I think it's just going to take off by itself because of the high yield. And that's to me, that's like putting fluoride in the water system. At some point, most of the beans in the system are high iron beans. And you, you don't have to convince the mothers or anybody. They're just... They're just, that's what the supply is, okay? You can't follow that strategy with the orange may. Uh, so you have to provide the, the knowledge of why, uh, why you would switch to an orange variety. You have to motivate that and you have to spend money to do that. We're lucky that they like the taste of the orange maize. So we do the blindfold test and the, everybody says, yeah, this is the white maize, this is the orange maize. But we got lucky, they liked the taste of the orange maize. So this is, uh, this is anecdotal, but our country manager uh, serves orange maize at home. His uncle, his uncle came and he sat down and he said, I'm not eating that stuff. And uh, they, they said, well, this is what we have. If you could just eat this tonight, we'll switch back to white maize for tomorrow's meals. And came the next day and they had white maize and he said, I didn't tell you to switch. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, they like the taste and they understand it costs the same amount of money. Um, it's orange, yeah, but it protects my family from vitamin A deficiency. So it's starting, starting to catch on. It's being sold in supermarkets. It's, uh, that's not our target audience, but you need, you need it to be marketed. You need a demand for it because the farmers want to be able to sell part of what they, part of what they grow. So I'm, I'm optimistic about what's going on with Zinc. And the last one is about the hybrids, okay? The, um, with the hybrid varieties, you have to pay more for the seed, but you get higher <laughs> yields. And so already most of maize production in Zambia and indeed in Africa, not all countries, but hybrids are starting to take over the production. Same with pearl millet. Uh, we do have open pollinated varieties available. We have been breeding open pollinated varieties for the for the more vulnerable populations. But it's going to be much more expensive to distribute those through the NGOs, whereas with the, with the uh, private seed companies, it's all now it's becoming part of their business. And you can just kind of leave it, leave it by itself and you don't, you don't have the cost. Now, our other, our other uh, crops are not hybrids. So you've got, uh, you've got rice, you've got wheat, the vegetatively uh, propagated crops like cassava and sweet potato, they're much more expensive to, to distribute and get out, get out to farmers. Okay, thank you. Um, should we take a question from online? Sure, yeah. Um, so there have been a few questions that have come up around the issue of soils. And so particularly Anita Blake and Sarah Mine asked how does uh, the effect how does the change in soil affect the nutrient requirements uh, for the biofortified plants? Um, and then, is there any research that can you speak to the ability of farm management practices to improve soil and plant health and human nutrition? So with the soil crop connection, would this be considered biofortification? And is there an area for more research? Thank you. Chris, um, do you have a hand up? I have a couple of questions. The first one relates to the interactions with, with other minerals. For example, maize, maize is phytate. And you know that you get phytate is impaired iron absorption, also impacts on zinc absorption, and calcium, and other bivalent uh, minerals. So I'm wondering if you increase the concentration of iron uh, in, in one of your uh, uh, products, and it does in the end affects the bioavailability and the absorption of other similar nutrients like 
iron and zinc and calcium, of course, will later. So if you're talking about effectiveness, do you factor that into account that maybe if you increase iron content, you're actually reducing zinc absorption and therefore compromising the zinc uh, 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 nutritional uh, flavor. The other one relates to the yellow maize. I, I, I remember in Zimbabwe we had a massive drought and we ended up importing yellow maize. Uh, even up to now, I can't eat yellow maize. It just did <laughs> not taste the same. Uh, we actually disliked it. But we had no choice, we ate it. But as soon as we got to produce our own white maize, we went back to, 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 to the white man. In fact, even in rural areas, my, my father has a meal, the whiter the maize, actually the better. We know that if you, the less white, it's, it's still got some of the, the nutrients. Mm -hmm. But people in the rural areas actually prefer mm -hmm. the whiter maize because the whiter maize is more refined and the status to it. Mm -hmm. So even if you, are, you go there and tell them that, oh, you know, the less white maize is more nutritious and good for your health, mm. but the social status and the taste trumps the nutritional status. Mm. So I, I, I'm curious about, in the end, the overall acceptability of the yellow maize. And in humanitarian situations where people have no option, I think it makes sense. But when you now it's fun to the general population, yeah. I personally... Yeah. <laughs> okay, Martin? Thanks for the presentation. So, as far as I understand, so for us to improve course of effectiveness, you need to sustain. Well, the question then is, you know, how can we accelerate adoption by farms of those of those new varieties? And I'm more wondering whether there is an opportunity in India. I mean, to accelerate that. I mean, the issue is that because of the extensive input subsidy regime that is in place in India, which is heavily kind of favoring I mean, the production of and actually hampering the diversification mm -hmm. into high quality agricultural food and vegetables. I mean, that's a very negative uh, effect of the subsidy regime that's in place. Now, of course, at the World Bank, we have many uh, views of you know, engagement with the government of India to actually change that subsidy regime and get rid of it, but for political and economic reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very difficult uh, uh, proposition. But the question then is now, if you recognize that negative effect, uh, for the purpose of you know, focusing on nutrition. The question is, can you actually change the rules of the game of that further subsidy uh, regime to actually provide incentives for adoption of bio uh, you know, millet or wheat or rice uh, by actually um, uh, putting a suggestion on the table that actually the procurement system in India and the corresponding public distribution system actually over time, and let's say over five years or over ten years, actually moved entirely to buy food grains, actually the public procurement system only by uh by uh, grains and the public distribution system and distribution system. Yeah. Is that a conversation that harms <coughs> the having with the government of India? Would that be exactly the accepted that would make it useful? So over to you, Howdy. Yeah. Maybe you want to repeat Martin's question, since people online may not have heard the question. Yeah. So yeah, again, I'll go in reverse order. So the the last question was about using uh, using the the food subsidy system in India. Given, despite okay, we have to take as a given that it's uh, inefficient to have these food subsidies, but given that it is inefficient. Can we use the system to drive adoption of biofortified crops? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, and that's going to be the main way, if we're successful, that'll be the main way that biofortified wheat and biofortified rice will be adopted. It's very difficult for us to, we can equal the yields of the best varieties, but it's very difficult for us to beat the yields of the best varieties in, Indi in the circumstance of India. So if the, if the government uh, officials would give preference to the purchase of biofortified varieties, they, they'd, still, they'd still be basically the same price because they're just as productive and you get the added value of the zinc in the wheat and in the rice. It makes sense. And the government officials, and we've talked to government officials about this, and they say, yes, let's try it. I need you know, 200 million tons. Uh, 
uh, you know, next week and let's do it. <laughs> and, and so that's, you know, that's the problem right now is we've just released the varieties. We don't have enough seed. We're, you know, we're trying to multiply the seed and get to the point where there's enough, you know, to where we can seriously start uh, getting into one of the state programs or, you know, getting our foot in the door. So that's, that's going to, if we're, if we're successful in India, that's absolutely going to drive the success. Now, at the same time, the food subsidy system has been given preference to wheat and rice and excluded millets. And millets are actually much more nutritious. And then we've got a high iron millet. So I was, uh, we met with, uh, in August, we met with the state government in Rajasthan, and they've agreed to do a pilot where they take the wheat they, they substitute high iron pearl millet for wheat in some of the districts in Rajasthan, and we're going to do a comparative analysis, an intervention, and a control, and see if we can record a, an improvement in iron status uh, through that. Um, so yeah, you hit, you absolutely hit the nail on the head there with India. Um, on the again, you asked about you know the orange is not is not uh, popular. But you know that's that's just what you know. This is this is what's not popular is this yellow maize. We do have a separate. It is uh, distinguishable in terms of its color. But the important thing is that they like people <coughs> like the taste. When they try it, they seem to like the taste. They don't like the taste of this because it's it's not really a lot of the stuff that was uh, sent as food aid wasn't bred for for human consumption. So that's that's what the you know that's exactly what the drama is. We have to we have to reach a certain threshold of people that try it and like it and eat it, and then and then if it really is a good product, it'll spread because the value proposition is is too good. You get vitamin A, it tastes good, uh, and it's the same price. So you know all I can say is you know come back in five years and let, we'll see we'll see what what happened in Zambia. Incidentally, FAO just gave us a big grant to now uh, introduce orange maize into Zimbabwe. So it's right next door, and we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. On the phytates, yeah, we had huge debates on, on phytates in the 1990s when we were trying to convince people to invest in biofortification. Some people said the absorption would be way too low because of the phytates. Other nutritionists said it depends on your iron status. If you have low iron status, you'll absorb a high percentage. If you have high iron status, you'll absorb a low percentage. There were, uh, there were debates about whether the meal methodology, uh, test meals over a few days, whether that really accurately measured the bioavailability if people had a chance to adjust over a longer period of time. And I can say that now the studies are in, and it shows the, the, the latter group was correct. The people with low iron status absorb at a much higher rate than the people with, with high iron status. We measured absorption rates as high as 15% when we uh, we did a high iron rice study in the Philippines in, in around, it was done in 2001, 2002. Um, so I was talking about the zinc iron interaction, not uh, that if you increase absorption of iron, then you compromise the absorption of zinc or calcium or iron because they're all. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, these we're we're adding at levels that are normally in diets. We're not we're not adding you know we're not fortifying with iron and zinc at the same time at high levels. So all of our our efficacy trials are you know we're having basically having very positive results on our efficacy trials. I'm not a I'm not a nutritionist, but uh, this is this is. What I know about the results of the efficacy trial. Uh, so there were there were several questions about soils and farm management practices. Uh, we've tried putting another way of adding zinc to the seeds is putting zinc and fertilizers. So you can put zinc and fertilizers. It gets in the soil and it makes its way into the seeds. We've done uh, several experiments with that. It does increase seed zinc content but not by enough to make that much of a difference. But we have found that when you spray zinc during a particular period of plant growth, 
you can, uh, if you add it to insecticides or whatever you're spraying for, you can massively increase the seed zinc content through spraying. The problem is we haven't found a, we haven't found the motivation for farmers to do that, the economic motivation for farmers to do that. They have to spray during a specific period of plant growth. Why, why would they do this? To feed their families with higher zinc? No, they're not, that's not gonna motivate them to, to spray. So we, we haven't found the economic motivation. Maybe in India, uh, if you could, uh, if you could bring in your your wheat and your rice that has higher zinc content, then that would give a motivation to the to the farmers if you you had that as part of your food subsidy program. Um, the uh, it's often asked whether we're going to deplete the soils of zinc and iron. You can you can deplete soils of nitrogen and phosphorus with just a few crops. So it's a completely different situation with trace minerals. There's, there are enough trace minerals in the soils for thousands and thousands of crops. The amounts, they're actually minute, they're, they're trace amounts that you're adding. You, you need them for your health, but they're physically just trace amounts and you're not significantly depleting the soils. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll stop with that. Okay, all right. Um, Rose, if you can check if there is a question online, and while you get that together, let me m mention two things. One on the PDS issue. I think what Martin said about biofortification and what you answered, similar conversations are happening around commercial fortification as well. Can we do commercially fortified wheat flour, for example, when you start through the PDS system? Uh, and second, on soils, um, and micronutrients, there is research ongoing on zinc fertilizers for soils that would go into the soil, but then into the crops and into food systems as well. So there are a bunch of other things that are ongoing as well. I know there are a couple of burning questions, so I would uh, request that you be really, really brief. Let's start with the online question, then we'll stop, and then we'll stop, and then we'll finish. Okay. Yeah. So two brief online questions. Um, one is, is there any risk of losing nutrients during processing of any food crops? And also, um, how can the private sector and the food industry um, become involved and better contribute to this? Thank you. Yes, I'm interested in opening up the codex discussion. Um, with the codex discussion, it seems like one risk you run with that is the question of whether or not genetic engineering can be used in biofortification, just because of the controversy So I'm, I'm interested in that, and I'm interested in what you hope to get out of that beyond the definition. Is it meaning that you have to achieve a certain level of biofortification? Is that what you're hoping to get? But how else are you going to deal with the controversy around genetic All right, thank you. Next, last So over to you, Harvey, and then I'll hand over to Stephen so that he can summarize all the wonderful things that have been said up to now. Okay. So with the with the uh, so again I go last back. Um, oh, we're we're not trying to we're we're trying to be the least invasive possible. So if farmers are growing a particular crop and they're using fertilizer. We just give them a variety that you just switch, replace one for the other, and you continue using fertilizer. If you don't use fertilizer, again, you just 
substitute one for one. We're not asking them to use more fertilizer, less fertilizer, do more plowing, less plowing. You just keep your practices the same. You just substitute the biofortified variety. Now farmers are facing many problems and that's the job of the agricultural research community to give them better, tech, better and better technologies to help them meet their problems. So for example, we're, the, our centers are breeding for climate change. They're breeding drought, drought tolerant varieties, submergence tolerant varieties. The beans are heat tolerant so that they can, they can adapt to climate change. What we're doing is we're piggybacking on the best varieties that are coming out because farmers eventually will be adopting these climate adapted crops and we, we need to make them biofortified otherwise people will forget about our biofortified varieties and they're going to they're going to adopt the climate adapted crops so that's that's kind of our our, our approach um, on the on the codex uh, I think the, one of the main things is to come up with standards. As biofortified crops become popular, we're, we're afraid that people will start selling things that are not, they'll label them as biofortified, but they won't be biofortified. So we need, we need some kind of standards to, to avoid that, and also with uh, international trade. Do you, do you mean a minimum level of nutrients? Yeah. Yeah. And it's up to the, and, and in the end, it's up to, obviously up to the, the, the codex process. Harvest Plus isn't going to say, this is what we want the standard to be. It's going to be the, the, the negotiation process that goes on. You, you, understand, you understand it much better than I do. Now, with the, you're, you're right, the genetic engineering is a huge problem. Um, the developing countries tend to love the idea of biofortification. Europe is a little bit wary because they're afraid we're pro-GMO. The U.S. is a little bit worried because they think we're anti-GMO. <laughs> so we're having our biggest problem with the United States and Europe. But the developing countries, they're all they're pretty much 100% for us. So what what we're trying to do is say the mode of production is not part of the definition, that's and that and that's. That's that's how we're trying to get you know get around that problem. So we have you know Anne McKenzie, she's very skilled and knows the codex. Yeah, she has the stars in the show. <laughs> so we're, that's how we're trying to trying to get around that. On the uh, on the question on the retention, um, absolutely a lot of the nutrients are lost in um, in the storage and the processing. So for example, in the vitamin A maize. When it's freshly harvested, and let's say it has 15 parts per million for vitamin A maize, and some of it's eaten right away. But when it's stored, it loses over time, over several months, it loses, it loses the level of the vitamin A. Uh, when it's processed into flour, it loses some of its vitamin A. So when we set the target levels, we take the, for the breeders, we take the losses in processing into account. We assume that 40%, on average, 40% of, no, 60% of the vitamin A is lost on average before it's consumed. But the 40% that's left, that's left provides half of your vitamin A requirement. So, so yes, we absolutely take account of the losses in processing. Um, we're, we want the food industry to be involved in buying the biofortified crops and putting them in their products, mainly, mainly because that creates the markets for the farmers. We don't think a lot of the processed foods don't have that much of the nutrient left in them when they're sold in the supermarket shelves, but because the food processing companies are buying them, that, that helps generate the market. And absolutely, the farmers want to be able to sell part of what they produce. Otherwise, they're not going to just uh, adopt the biofortified crops for their own families. Okay, thank you. Um, no more online. Over to you, Stephen. Yeah, I, I think what I'm hearing is is the need to get both the science and the art um, right. And you described that as the drama. Right, and so the science has now delivered a lot of uh, results, and the drama is now 
maybe the most challenging thing uh, with perceptions, adoption, um, distribution systems, seed, particularly for potatoes, things like that. And in some ways, uh, I, I'm thinking maybe World Bank's role is more about leveraging the science and so dealing with the drama. Yeah, um, it's one thing we can finance the NARS and whatever, that's going to take some years and whatever. But we are trying to interact with subsidy systems, with uh, uh, the IFCs working with uh, food, food companies. Uh, um, so I, I think that's um, maybe a, an area where we need to be looking at is beyond the, beyond the drama. I think the, you, the point you made about in circumstances where you're, you're getting a um, higher yield or greater disease resistance, then the science take the science trumps the art, right? So it solves the, it solves the problem. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And to the extent to which the next generation of breakthroughs are of that nature, then then the sort of burden of, of uh, adoption will, will be lower. Um, uh, I'm not going to end with a question, but I'll catch, I'll catch you afterwards. So I have a question <laughs> on the uh, thinking about uh, the cost side. But uh, I just want to thank everybody and uh, the, the folks who are connected and their questions. And uh, uh, thank Howard for a very interesting, uh, thought provoking presentation. And uh, uh, we're very happy you were able to come. Okay, thank you. Thank you.